Today I'm going to teach you the history that you never learned. This is history stuff that is not taught in schools and the context of it isn't even shared. Why is that important? Because this is the history of attachment. I want to teach you exactly what attachment has looked like through our history, especially over the last century, and why in particular attachment styles have got broken and broken and broken much worse down to the present day. We're going to be talking over the last at least 100 years here in the West. This is research I've been doing for the last 14 years, tying in these various pieces. I've given talks on this before. That's the stuff you need to know. People ask me about this all the time. Adam, why is attachment so bad nowadays? Let me lay it out for you and explain exactly why, what it means for you, and what we can do about it. Because the next stage is going to get pretty messy until we turn this thing around by working on attachment and bringing it back to the heart of every culture. So let's jump right in. So as we're about to jump into this, I want to make sure that you know every resource I have available is on adamlanesmith.com on my website. I used to host a blog on there and I will probably bring that back. This talk today, some of it was written down inside one of my blog entries that I had. People went wild for that blog entry, by the way, about the history of attachment. People have not thought about general generational broken attachment over the last five generations. We're going to talk about that today here in just a moment, but check out adamlanesmith.com if you're wanting to learn more about attachment, find my books, find everything on there. Don't miss it. All right, let's jump into this really quick. What is attachment? Why does it matter? Really fast, we're going to have to return to the dawn of time, the dawn of humanity. Hunter-gatherers. For the majority of our culture and majority of our life as humans on this planet, we were hunter-gatherers. We haven't even begun to catch up yet. The Neolithic Revolution, where we learned that if we eat some seeds and we poop them out, why? If we come back, they've grown. Hey, we can put seeds in the ground ourselves on purpose. That was the Neolithic Revolution, when we started building permanent settlements. That was about 12,000 years ago. The research shows Homo sapiens have been on this planet planet, uh, 200,000, 300,000 years, it seems like, as the first ones. That's an awful long time to be hunting and gathering. We were in small, mostly small tribal groups. A lot of this research, if you look online, you can find all kinds of anthropologists who've done a lot of studies on this. I believe one of my favorites, I believe his name is pronounced Peter Gron. Very fascinating work if you go ahead and research him, but he will walk you through exactly what hunter-gatherers did, how they lived, deep research into some of this, and it's fascinating. But one thing you need to be aware of is that we were not meant to live in completely separated, iso like isolated cubicle world. We're not meant to be keep secrets from each other. We were living in family units with hardly even a wall between us. Everyone knew everyone, but everyone's survival depended on harmony, cohesion, and actual health. So these were not angry, brutal groups where the biggest guy beat the rest of the family to death for fun. These were groups where we would tightly connect and the ones who connected the best survived. So humans adapted multiple brain chemicals, oxytocin, vasopressin, serotonin, all of these things to help us socially connect and reward us for social connection, including from the top down, not just from the bottom up. All of those connections happen and it's on purpose to have loving connected networks. This is crucial. Attachment is the way we connect within these networks to give and receive love with each other, to understand what we can expect from the rest of the tribe and understand what they expect of us. If we grow up with broken attachment, it can be the belief no one else is going to ever act in good faith with us or the belief that we don't deserve good faith because there's something innately flawed in us or a blending of the two. That brokenness isn't supposed to be there. We're supposed to have networks that take care of us. So we're supposed to have our immediate family, parents, siblings, extended family network, tons of aunts, uncles, grandpa, grandma, all this crap, all these cousins. We're supposed to have those networks. We're supposed to have then the, that's called the kin, the network, the kith network, the tight friends of family network around us. We're supposed to have then our over culture, our larger culture that we have. We're supposed to have our religious cultures. Well, there's five, five networks that are supposed to take care of us. We're going to talk about how all five have now become broken, but all five networks, if a child slips through one, the next one catches them, the next one catches them, the next one catches them, so that they can unify and build a strong bond and maintain good attachment and learn that love is possible and that good faith is possible and that they deserve to be loved, even if one of those five networks breaks down on them. We are supposed to have these five networks, five safety nets, if you will. This is built into the human species. It's built into us. Safety in numbers is 
encoded in our DNA and acceptance and love from our tribe is also encoded in our DNA. So when we don't believe we are loved or lovable or anyone else will ever be loving us because of them, our brain goes to this place of I'm on the outskirts of the settlement in the rocks and weeds and I have to sort of scrape for a living and people only let me stay here because they sort of tolerate me because I give some value to them. So I have to earn approval to keep this, this network of people not killing me. And maybe if I'm good enough, they will leave me alone. And maybe if I'm scared enough, I will stay alert in case of dangers because no one else is ever going to come and protect me. This is what the brain is thinking. Now, fast forward to, let's say, beginning of World War One, right before World War One. Arguably here in the West, especially Civil War, Reconstruction Era, a lot of things here in the West started breaking down. The female networks maintained strength, but a lot strength, but a lot of the males went into the Industrial Revolution. Industrial Revolution really messed up a lot for attachment. We'll talk about that here in a bit, though, as it really ramped up. But let's even just let's say it was things were mostly okay. Families were able to mostly endure and survive here in the West, and especially in America, where I've done a lot of the research on this, until about World War One. Then we had multiple big factors came and changed. I mean, number one, you had the Industrial Revolution really kicked into high gear. You had World War I, where an entire generation of young men got thrown into a meat grinder. An entire generation of young women, we don't talk about these, but the entire generation of young women lost their husbands, their fathers, their sons. The older generation of women lost their sons. Women just were devastated during this time as the men were just brutally killed. And the men who survived and came back, we didn't have a word for post-traumatic stress disorder yet. We had, what do they call back then, the thousand yard stare and they also just called them cowards you are just a coward for having trauma just keep screaming <laughs> just keep killing and screaming and now go home and settle down and talk to your family just live a normal life with ptsd it's not real that's what they used to say so you had the lost generation they were also called the, the, the lost generation to be frank that's what they called them coming back you're talking about ernest hemingway you're talking about john steinbeck a lot of the authors the despair authors this was a whole generation of young men so they came home and what do we have the Roaring Twenties, where people could sink themselves into vice and sin to try to escape from the pain, what they were living. Plus, we had the Industrial Revolution, a lot of rough jobs, long working hours. You also, during, during the 1920s, you saw more Americans, all of a sudden, living in cities than living rurally. Everyone had to move inward to live in cities to pull income, to be able to afford things, all kinds of things happened, but people moved into cities. Cities, as you move into cities, your entire family network doesn't all move together with property and everything. You move in patches, you might be shoved into different apartment buildings, you might struggle, you might be separated from these networks that were supposed to protect you. Now you have an entirely new network you haven't even learned how to connect with yet. Maybe back then a lot of your network would move with you, but it was rough settling down. And then your parents would have to work 16 to 18 hour jobs pretty rough to get away from them. And then moms started more and more having to do all the household work alone instead of having family and connectors around that could do the work with them. Women all of a sudden were one and only maintainers of the home. Brutal, really brutal. Then you had the Dust Bowl where families really lost their farms and flooded into, into the cities. Then you had the stock market crash and the Great Depression. Then you had the ramp up of war in Europe and fear and terror across Europe and people fleeing for their lives. And then you had World War II. We have the greatest generation who survived all these hardships and then went and beat up the Nazis, the greatest generation and the silent generation, both of them wrapped in there where they just suffered and endured in silence for their family. And that's all that they could think to do was survive and get through. So they would save piles. I remember my, my great grandfather would save a bucket of old nails and screws and would say, well, you never know when you're going to need them because they didn't even have shoes back then. Many times they couldn't afford shoes. They had food rationing and meat rationing, all kinds of hardcore rationing just to survive through the wars, but also the, the financial crashes. So they would hand buckets of these bolts and things to their kids as an I love you, but their kids didn't grow up hearing I love you. Their kids grew up with rough, tough discipline and silence in broken family systems with family extended families cracked and broken, networks not as connected, and religious con networks really starting to fall apart and fray at the edges. All kinds of changes, all kinds of scandals started erupting too as, as really bad faith actors started <laughs> boiling to the surface all kinds of things started exploding and the safety network started peeling away and peeling away and peeling away then you had the baby boomer generation who came along 
and said, about half of them said, my parents love me and they suffered in silence for me. And I get it. That's really hard, but life is just awful. So we're going to have to just get through this. Let's buckle down and get through this horrible life. And then the other half of the baby boomers, more or less, said, my parents would get me at all. They treat me like crap. I hate their guts. Screw those guys. Love, sex, rock and roll and drugs and everything we can. Let's go have sex in the park with the hippies. And baby boomers just 50-50. They, ex they exploded. It wasn't quite 50-50, but many of them just erupted into massive selfishness. And many of them in their 70s, by the way, are still tripling the divorce rate in their 70s. Imagine getting divorced in your 70s. Like, I don't want to say what's the purpose, but tripling the divorce, the average divorce rate in the 70s right now. Many of them have bumper stickers. I'm spending my kids inheritance. Inheritance was no longer useful. Spending things and, and sharing things down through the generation, no longer expected. Me, 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 you take care of you. My parents gave me nothing but a bucket of rusty bolts for no reason because they hated me that much. I'm at least not doing that to you, but get out. I don't have to take care of you past 18. The baby boomers gave birth to Generation X. Generation X and Generation Y grew up in a certain world that then was shut off and turned into a digital world completely alien and foreign to them. So their world is now gone. The world they were prepped for, X and Y, gone. They have no idea. They, they live like deer in a headlights. Like, what's happening? They're just like so confused and terrified. And baby boomers just spent all of their childhoods and teens and 20s and 30s yelling at them saying, do something, live your life. And they're like, and they don't have no idea how because every system has shut down. Every system is broken. Baby boomers filled them with the importance of family and then broke up the marriage and broke up the family. Everything broke up. Everything was shattered. Everything was destroyed. Generation X and Y, they have no idea how to live. Baby boomers went on and got married again for a second time and had the millennials and said, we're going to raise these kids right. So they tried to make clones of themselves and ended up making a generation that hates them because both sides are so focused on self-preservation and self-fulfillment that anyone who threatens that becomes their enemy. And millennials have never really seen functioning relationships, functioning religious organizations, functioning social networks and functioning network villages and tribes and neighborhoods and functioning extended families and not even having seen functional like core families. Millennials were the first generation to not see any of the five functioning networks at all. At all. At least the baby boomers had that. They grew up in it. They tore it apart, but they grew up in it. Generation X and Y at least grew up hearing about it and sort of seeing some remnants of it before it was tear torn away. Millennials, they saw that on movies. Those things are pretend. Secure attachment is fake and pretend. That's what many millennials would believe. Not all, not all, like all, not all baby boomers did all this, but a lot. And it's getting worse because now all five safety networks are gone. So now millennials give way to, what's the next one? Generation Z, is it Z? And they are growing up in a meat grinder of millennials and Generation X and Generation Y parents who don't know how to function in life, don't know that a secure, loving establishment can work, an attachment can work, can be stable and loving and secure. They have not seen any of the five networks. They only know that this world is messed up. They don't know how long it's been messed up. They don't know why it's messed up. They just know it's horrific. Many of them are committing suicide even at age 10 or 11. Pediatricians are sounding the alarm and no one is hearing it because no one wants to talk about it. It's very uncomfortable. But a 10 and 11 year old suicide rates are skyrocketing. You know when the iPhone came out in 20, 2007? Teen depression rates skyrocketed because they started isolating and being able to just plug themselves into a dopamine box 24 hours a day and that did not fulfill them. It led to greater depression because that's what most of them are doing is plugging themselves into dopamine filters and just getting as much dopamine as they can. Now, you don't vasopress and bond with people by solving problems because you've learned from childhood. Families don't solve problems together. No one solves problems together. Everyone has to be alone. So I need to solve things on my own. I can't vasopress and bond. I can't ask for a affection and care and warmth and nurturing. My parents never did that. They didn't even know how to do that. Neither did their parents. That's just not something you ask for. You can't ask for a hug. You can't ask to spend time together. You can't ask for, no, I can't do oxytocin bonding. And if you can't do those things, you're certainly not going to get much serotonin through your relationship which is a core element of getting serotonin in your brain. You're not going to release much GABA, which is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that suppresses anxiety and depression responses, especially during these times when you need that the most. <laughs> more than, I wouldn't say more than previous generations, but in our own unique existential challenges, they had to fight tigers. They had to fight wars. We have to fight daily existential dread from pure loneliness and our brain going back 30,000 years ago in a hunter-gatherer territory saying, I live on the outskirts of a, of a village. Everyone else cares about each other. No one cares about me. No one's going to help me. If I get hurt, I'm going to starve to death. If I get hurt, injured or something, I'm going to die. No one's ever going to save me. I am alone all the time. So I must be scared all the time. I must be on guard all the time. I can never relax, ever. 
And then we try to find one stranger that we can have sex with and marry and trust for the rest of our life and have babies with from strangers who also live out in the rocks and weeds. It is total, total lone wolf mentality over and over and over. And it's not meant to be this way. Generation, what is the new one? Generation Z. Now, what are we back around to? Generation Alpha? Is that what it is now? I can't even remember. They are worse off than any of us because they're entering a war zone where all the generations are fighting to the death and trying to destroy each other and wish they were dead. And suicide rates are exploding. Drug rates are exploding. People are escaping into dopamine and please begging anything and anyone they can to rescue them from the pain. And of course, people are stepping forward to say, oh, I'll rescue you because there's always going to be people taking advantage of pain and suffering to try to gain power. That's just how it works. And it doesn't matter what political spectrum you point at, everyone everywhere is happy to take that control. That's how government works. That's how politics work, unfortunately. This is the history of attachment. This is what we're dealing with. This is why I'm working so hard to teach this. To fix this, we must fix attachment in ourselves first. We must understand that there's better than this. The five safety net, five networks, but the intimate loving connection, that that is okay. What our brains are meant to fulfill and hold, what we're meant to live in, the networks we're meant to be and surrounded by, the people, the connections. Learning a secure attachment style is step one. Step two is connecting to other people with secure attachment styles and building any kind of safety net at all for your primitive brain. For our, for our hunter-gatherer brains to say, I don't live in the rocks. At least I've got five other weirdos with me, but at least we all take care of each other. We have to live under a bridge with coyotes, but there's five or six of us under here under this bridge and we will take care of each other. There's an Icelandic proverb from Iceland that says, bear is the back of a brotherless man. If you have at least one brother, your back is no longer naked. You're not going to get stabbed and you can rest at night while someone watches over you. This is the purpose of building secure attached networks. As you connect with these things, like, like with my private community, my attachment circle discord community, there should be a link for that down below or it's in my link tree. It's on my website, adamlanesmith.com. We are building a connection like this because people in there don't have loving family. They have painful, toxic family. They don't have friends because they don't know how to build those friend networks or they don't know how to connect to the friends that they do have. They're, they're just not sure. They don't even know how to talk to them about attachment. They want to be around me because I was the first person they heard really talk about attachment. Not a fan club for me, but they want to be around me and they want to be around the other members of the group, dozens and dozens of us who are working on attachment and will understand them. They want to be around people with shared principles. They want to be around people they can open up with and say, Is, am I okay? Am I really okay, guys? Can you accept me? Yes, we do. Okay. What are, you know, I, I need a job. Can anyone give me some ideas on how to get a better job? Yes. We jump in and we start talking about different step to, uh, tactics. Okay. I have this problem at my job. Can someone help me navigate this relationship? Here's what my, my sister's doing. What should I do? Here's what my parents have done to me. Here's the, I've got going on here. I have this trauma. Didn't anyone else relate to me? And what should I do to make this better? And we work together inside this network. We are rebuilding inside of here the kith network, right? There's family, core family, immediate family, then extended family, kin, then kith the friends of the family that are almost like family. We are rebuilding that kith network. This is what's crucial. We must be doing this all over the earth. And many people are doing this. There are a lot of online communities. There are a lot of communities stepping up. People are building these. We need them, but they must be guided by secure attachment, which alleviates the emotional pain and fear that we're living under. That improves our quality of life, but it allows us to start seeing opportunities and building those networks. So as you build those networks, you start changing the environment each one of you touches and you start pushing back against actual bad faith actors. There's not that many. And you start guiding new principles into the relationships with the people around you who don't understand attachment yet. This is how we change the world. As we start teaching this in depth to more and more people, think, God, I am online and I'm on TikTok. My, TikTok's my biggest platform. I'm at Attachment Bro and I have 250,000, over 250,000 followers, a quarter of a million followers on TikTok. They come to me learning attachment, learning this. If you, if you need a white pill, there's your white pill for the day. <laughs> 250,000 people on TikTok are learning this from me. I have live events six times a week and people come in in the hundreds to learn and learn and learn and learn for at least an hour each time with me and ask questions and say, how do I do this? What should I do here? Is this normal? What can I do here? And I teach and teach and teach. That's why I do this is so that the next world, so generation alpha and generation you know, whatever, beta or bravo or whatever I call them, generation, who knows? The next few generations can start building back in those five networks. Because when those networks start getting rebuilt, then kids who would have slipped through the gaps, they get caught and protected and nurtured and trained, retrained, reprogrammed in a good way into secure attachment again so they don't grow up broken and lost. They grow up with hope. They get fixed in the right ways. They know that they can deserve love and they know that they can get love. And that's how we start changing the world.
This is the brief history of attachment over the last 100 years. I've done a lot of research on this, a lot of work, and done talks on this. Now you understand what we're dealing with. Now you understand why it's worse than ever before. Now you understand what we're looking for to fix this in the future. We can fix this together. Wherever you are at, start connecting with the people around you. You are making the world better. By learning attachment, you're making it better. By applying attachment, you're really making it better. And if you don't know where to begin, you are welcome to join my attachment circle community. Click the link down in the description. Check out my link tree. Check my website, adamlanesmith.com. Jump in. Jump into our community and start working with us. Build that network back in. But you've got a lot of options and you need to explore them. Now that you understand, you know what you're looking for. Drop me a comment down below, if you would, please, with how surprising this was, which generation you are, if you knew some of this already. If you think this is kind of weird and you're going to need to see some a little bit more research on it, let me know. Drop me comments down below with your thoughts on this topic, because we need to be talking about this history. This is something most people have never studied and never put all together like this. And it's time that we did.